Welcome back everyone. Hello and welcome to our RegCast. It's been a while since we've been live. I hope you've been keeping busy by watching our on-demands or something like that. Well, we've got something fresh for you here. I think it's going to be a good one today. I'm quite looking forward to this one. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about managing security in real time. Seems like a good idea. See what I did there? Seems like a good idea. Why are we talking about that? Well, because uh, the, what we're arguing today is that uh, if you want to be secure, you need real-time reporting today. Well, is the, you know, even if you've invested in the SIM over the last 10 years, is it up to the job? If it's not up to the job, what should you be doing? What should you be doing? Uh, what should you be investing in to make this work better? Well, who's going to talk to us about that then? Well, we've got a fresh person in the studio for you today. Raj, you're from McAfee, now part of Intel Security. What do you do there, Raj? So I'm the EMEA CTO at McAfee, but I have a couple of other hats. So I'm the Special Advisor at Europol and um, Chief Innovation Officer for the Cloud Security Alliance. Ooh. This is good. So you spend a lot of your time going around talking about this sort of thing, don't you? Uh, yeah. So we do a lot of work with regards to um, you know looking at what the future of security is across multiple verticals, mm. but actually also working with law enforcement on um, actually the bad the bad guys and you know how they're evolving as well. Can you tell us very much about what you do for that or is that a secret? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you recently saw the Operation Tovar, so you've seen some of the work we've done there. We, we published uh, some yeah. details of that. So um, we're a security company, so we work with police, yeah. as you would expect. How did you get into all this then? Uh, it's my wife's idea. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is my wife's idea. No, I mean, you know, the reality was, um, I, when I started university, uh, there was a choice of going into networking or security. And, and, the, and the reality was, you know, in my, in my master's dissertation, I wrote about a bastion host. It was even before there was such a thing as cyber security. And I just loved security. And so I had a conversation with my wife and I said, well, this is what I love to do, but there's no money in it. And nobody really cares about it. To there's networking, everyone's doing it, and it's a great opportunity. Uh -huh. So we just went with the passion. Great. So, yeah, it was, it was, it's worked out well for you. I gather the area's grown a little bit since then. Um, yeah, a few people have heard about cybersecurity, yeah, would you believe? Yeah, now, a, a, a man that's been talking about cybersecurity for a long time. And, and you've been involved in it back when you were on the other side, back you were on, your, on the user side, Tony? Yeah, but it wasn't called cybersecurity then. What was it? What did they call it then? Um, just do it. <laughs> yeah, it didn't have its own there, name. There might have been an explicative in there somewhere. Did you work for Nike? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm an Adidas man. <laughs> That's it. Um, but th there's a slight typo here. It's not white hat lock, it's white hair lock. Yes. <laughs> All right. We were trying to be nice to you. This time. <laughs> but, you know, I've, I've learned my lesson, actually. What's the point? Uh, so now, uh, guys, you're watching this. You'll probably have a lot of questions. If you ask your questions, please do. Use the button, ask your questions. And if you ask your questions there, they'll come out here on my little, uh, uh, yeah, on, on my little tablet here. And then I'll ask them to the guys here. And one thing that I found out in the last you know, half hour or so is that both these guys have a lot of opinions not always the same one about anything you might care to ask. So yeah, fire away, give it a, give it a go and we'll uh, try and get into your questions today. We've got a lot of material today, haven't we? We've got a lot to get through. Mm -hmm. So we'll try and get through all of your questions. If we don't, they'll answer them afterwards, something like that. So let's have a look at the problem, first of all, Tony. So um, yep. we've got some of your famous bars. What does this mean? We have, so we asked the register audience, you know, time after time, as you know, about all areas of security. And so the first thing is, well, okay, we, we hear so much about the device explosion. Is that happening to you? And as you can see from the charts here that uh, either the vast majority of people are seeing an explosion in smartphones, use of Macs, mobile devices, mobile apps, mm -hmm. tablets, hybrids, life, the universe and everything, and all the way down to cloud services. So there is a genuine exposure of more and more devices to more and more systems. Some of these devices are owned by the organization, um, but interestingly, people talk about you know, the, the use of personal devices for business use, but they don't often talk about the use of business devices for personal use. And the two are you know, pretty much the different sides of the same coin. And are we saying and that, this, is, this is just insecure? This is going to make you less secure? Well, no, we're not saying this is insecure. We're saying it's broadening the exposure that you have to risk uh -huh. because you've got so many more different devices to look after at brain different platforms. Before in the past, you might have been an organization that was almost entirely Windows. Mm -hmm. Might have been various generations of Windows, but it was you know, reasonably standard. Now you've got almost everything that you could think of to look after and try and protect 
Yeah. I think the interesting thing here is, you know, in the past we used to talk about, well, that's a consumer device, that's a business device, you know, that's for critical infrastructure. You know, these various different, um, these gaps that we had are basically converging into one. So, you know, today my smartphone is a consumer device, it's a business device, and now we're even seeing on the app stores things like, you know, SCADA applications, so for critical infrastructure as well. So the attack service, and I think we're going to go through that later, hmm. is just increasing exponentially. The, the one part of this chart that is certainly collapsing is this, you know, um, no but little demand at the moment for the use of any of these devices. That's shrinking quite dramatically over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's have a look at this one. This is the, uh, this is your what's going to happen in the future. Well, this is what's happening now uh, and what's going to happen in the future. So we, we asked the register audience, you know, where do you see the threats coming from? And we split it up into the two sides of the coin. So internal threats, you know, so people making mistakes, people deliberately leaking information or stealing information. Um, customers and prospects being part of the risk portfolio now, as well as suppliers and your business partners, or coming from outside of the business completely, so enemy fire, so friendly fire, enemy fire. When we've asked this sort of question in the past, usually the political answer was, you know, all the threats are coming from outside, but, you know, in the bar, when you have a chat with people, they'd all say, actually, the vast majority of the trouble comes from inside. Mm -hmm. You know, either by, you know, just people making mistakes, doing things wrong, not knowing what they're doing, um, but that was really the exposure. Now you can see that they're pretty balanced between friendly fire and external threats. So there's a real challenge here that it's not just looking after inside anymore that was really where the bulk of the problem was. Now it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And when we ask, well, OK, how are things going to change in the future? You can see everything's going to get worse. Basically, anything that's green there is people saying it's getting worse. It's getting worse, yeah. Oh, the, the, the light green says no change, but that's basically no change from a pretty desperate situation to begin with. Yeah. And as you can see, we, we've got the national government agencies on here, and people actually recognise that they might be a challenge as well. Mm. How you protect against them is a completely different question. That's a, and, and probably not one for this regcast, not one for this unfortunately. Regcast, but, but yeah, it's but, but like, it's yeah. another it's another potential area of exposure depending on the business you're in. Yeah, is this, uh, this? But that's a good thing. You know, I think what we're seeing here is first of all recognition of the threat landscape. Yep. But also, you would hope that if people start to invest in threat intelligence, they can begin to get a better understanding. So maybe the. Look, here's a great example. You know, the CISO's job is very difficult. And, and, and I think, you know, this I actually experienced and maybe you did in, you know, in a past life. But when you get budget from the business and you put money into security, the irony is, is that security incidents begin to, go, begin to increase. It's the complete opposite of most other environments. So yep. what you do is you then say to the business, hey, look, thanks for making the investment. We've now got an increase in security incidents because we're recognizing them, we're reporting them. And then the business goes, well, hang on, we've just put money in. Why do we need more? But the truth and the reality is, is that, you know, understanding your risk is the number one key, oh, is, is the foundation with which we build security. There's also another element that we're just beginning to see come into play, and that's that when organisations have invested in security in the past, it's really been as an insurance mechanism. You know, we have to do this because we have to do it. We're seeing slowly over the course of the last few years, particularly with the expansion of mobile systems, um, businesses saying, hey, there might actually be business reasons for doing something now, but security has been inhibiting us. Mm. Now we want to maybe invest in security so that we can do something new. And that's a bit of a flip round compared to the past. It's still not pervasive by any means, but, but it's growing from a low base. But, but it I, is being recognised that security mm. can enable us, if we get it right, to do new things that in the past would have said, hey, no, we're not touching that. Because, you see, here's the thing, cause it's instinctive. When you're faced with, like, big bars like this of it's a mess and it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse, your instinctive reaction is to start locking things down and yep. to say people can't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. So if nobody's really doing very much out of the ordinary or creative or unusual, then you're more but, but, but the environment now is such that the user expectation and the line of business manager expectation is that we will do new things, we can do new things. Why can't we? Yeah. And that's a flip round. But it's more than this. You know, I think we talk about security, but it's not about security, it's about trust. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a great case in point is um, the Pono and Institute put forward what they call the abnormal churn rate. And that, that is the percentage of people that will no longer shop with an organization because of a data breach. And so at the moment, I think it's somewhere between about three to 5%. So consider that, you know, three to 5% of your business or your customers will no longer shop with you because they don't trust you. 
So when we talk about security as an enabler, it's an enabler for growth. It's, a, it's an enabler for innovation. Um, and so it's, it's good to see that people are recognizing the threat. The question becomes, with the threat landscape increasing, with the attack surface increasing, how do we begin to impart trust within these systems such that our consumers, the regulators, trust us? Yeah. The, the, the one thing I would say, though, is that trust is not something that you can instill and put into a system. What you can do is put in secure systems so that people yeah. come to trust you. you. You can't buy trust. Only people can give you trust. So it's a yeah. slight semantic thing, but it is really important. Okay, let's have a, a, a little bit of a look at the uh, state of security management here. Yeah. So, because uh, also because we've got a, a, a sort of question about this. Cause we, I want to explain to some people about where we've got to with SIM and you know and, okay. and what's happened in the last ten years about yeah. that, just so we can say why why we're talking about it today exactly. as well. So this is sort of summarising where the register audience have told us yeah. that they are at the moment, and that's basically that we've got lots of tools, mm -hmm. but they're all individual tools that don't talk together very well. Um, so very little integration. We've got an awful lot of data coming from them, and we can't really tell, you know, when someone's crying wolf or not. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we're not even monitoring things that we know we really should be monitoring, but we're not sure how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's very, very little automation in there. Basically, the automation tool of choice is the register audience. They're the people that do the integration and make everything work and do all the responses, which means that essentially we're in a firefighting mode, relying on people's um, in own intelligence and their guesswork um, and their experience to really try and work out what to do, how to prioritise things, how to respond. But that means that inherently yeah, it's it's very slow with the threat landscape today. But you can't tell because you've got no visibility. You're generating so much information in these logs now, aren't you? You just can't tell what to do just yeah. by looking well, the at example, things. I mean, the example that I'll give is today's security systems are like a mouse in a maze trying to get a piece of cheese. Uh -huh. You know, what happens is the mouse basically comes across an obstacle says, well, okay, I'm going to try, you know, that hasn't worked, I'm going to stop, I'm going to turn around, I'm going to try another path. But the reality is, is today the hacker's going to go in, you know, let's say, for example, to use a network-based attack, go, well, actually, that didn't work, I'm going to try something else, let's try over email. Well, that didn't work, well, let's try USB, let's try spear phishing, let's try something else. And so the security tools that you have don't interoperate, don't say to, don't say to one another, hey, guess what, these guys are going to try to do something, we might want to keep an eye on this. So they don't share threat intelligence. They don't share contextual information. So the reality is, it's just like a piece of, you know, it's just like the rat in a maze. They're just going to but try different paths. The, the difference as well is that it may not be a piece of cheese. It may be, you know, very tiny bits of cheese that are spread around in different places. So actually understanding where all of those are to make a lump. We're going we're to have a big place. day for metaphors, aren't we? I can see that. <laughs> the, um, now, we now, like cheese. <laughs> yes, <help me. laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, now, tell me about the state of the sim now. You know, because when you talk about these things, the instinctive from some vendors, the instinctive reaction. I understand not from you, Raj. The instinctive reaction is buy a, buy a sim, stick it in there. That'll sort the whole thing out. Lots of the audience have got sim solutions, um, yeah. whether they're called sim or not, it is to a degree irrelevant. But they so the are, basic concept is yeah, we, we, we've people have got. A solution, but as I said, usually they've got multiple solutions that aren't integrated. Mm -hmm. So they don't have much in the way of an ability to actually correlate all of this information that's coming in to get the big picture. Mm -hmm. Because the threat landscape now is such, you know, I'm sure Raj will back yeah. us up on this, that it's not always immediately clear that, you know, one alarm means that's the threat. You know, that the way things are now so subtly deployed into organizations, you have to spot different things happening and put them together. And that's where you need the automation to actually do that correlation for you. I mean, a good example was we saw Operation Dragonfly just recently, and that was a targeted attack against critical infrastructure devices. And the way the attackers actually built out, or really, you know, the initial infection was, you know, they would, in, you know, they would create watering holes, they would use elements of spear phishing, all of that, you know, they create the beachhead, and then once they create the beachhead, then they then attack the SCADA devices. And so, it, you know, it wasn't just, OK, well, I'm going to go and do X, and that's fairly easy to indicate, and that's fairly easy to spot. Um, you know, you saw recently when game over, with Game Over Zeus, you know, the original iteration of Zeus, i.e. the first piece of malware, you can detect it via specific network traffic. You know, it was, OK, if I saw this packet every three minutes going to this IP address, I know that it's infected. But Game Over Zeus had a really complicated domain generation algorithm. In other words, it would go to, spe it would go to different... C2 or command and control yeah. servers as and when required. So it was, it, you know, we're innovating as an industry, but so are the bad guys.
Mm -hmm. Now there's a couple of questions here. There's, you know, there's quite a specific one here. The first, the first one coming saying, if you're doing effective sim, do you do packet capture and you correlate that with the events? Is that basically, does that solve your problem for you? Not on its own, I'd Not say. On its own. It, it's part of, you know, part of. When, you know, when I talk about the rat in the maze, it's yeah. about an orchestrated defense. In yeah. other words, you know, the attack you might get might be going, you know, maybe a USB key, right? It might be something else, but we need the ability for your endpoint to be able to talk to the sim to be able to say, hey, guess what? I'm seeing this. Is this something we need to be concerned yeah. about? I mean, my thing about that is stay tuned, actually, because we're going to get into a sort of like, a, you know, where that fits in. Yeah into how you think so. The, the flip side here as well is the stuff that Raj just talked about. Yeah. It's not just traditional IT systems no. that are being attacked now. It could be things that in the past you thought were dumb because they're not dumb anymore. So now, and, and also we're looking at the um, uh, Marco's um, come from Switzerland. Oh, welcome, Marco. The, um, uh, his remark is saying that, um, yeah, the, the old school was to lock things down. Uh, now you need to support the business. But now we've got the Internet of Things becoming part of the business. Now this just changes, yeah. changes the, the, the size and the scale of things, doesn't it? We're also going to come on to that a little bit. As yeah, well, so we've like got that. a great um, diagram where we show the, the next, really the smart grid and what it looks like. Yeah. Um, I'm going to plug my two books, by the way. I've got two books. You've got two this. books out? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know books. there was book plugging coming Yeah, there's, a, there's two books, one on smart oh. grids and the other on cloud computing. I mean, yeah. But, yeah. Are we allowed to plug books? <laughs> Too late. Um, <laughs> but the reality is, is what businesses are now asking, or mm. what businesses are now doing is they're now innovating. They yeah. want to go the last inch into the home. They want to become more personalized. They, you know, I'm not allowed to mention the S word, you know, the piece of malware attack in the nuclear facility. But the reality is that the attack surface is increasing at such an alarming rate. And security and privacy isn't being integrated by design in many of these Im implementations. Yeah, that's, I, so yes, it, is it basically this comes with the opportunity, if you want the opportunity, taking care of this stuff. It's got to be thought about right from the beginning. Right from the, oh, be yeah. right from the beginning of it. Let's have a, let's have a look at some, uh, get through your, uh, I said this again, get through your charts. Oh, you know I don't mean this. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> again, this comes from the recent survey that we did with the register audience. Two groups. Yeah. And we, we managed by correlating the answers, you know, to get back to correlation again, yeah. between several different questions, that there were two distinct groups in there. There were the confident group that were really positive about their security position, mm -hmm. um, that were happy in the way that they were attacking things, that they had a good understanding of, you know, all the threats that, that were out there, um, and everybody else. Yeah. And as you can see from this, the, the use of maybe more sophisticated elements of security around analytics, um, looking at defending against advanced persistent threats, as well as actually exploiting the threat intelligence to get back to something that Raj mentioned just now mm. from supplies, is much higher amongst that more confident group, more, maybe more experienced group who come from, you know, obviously industries where that pressure is really on them compared to everybody else. You know, security analytics, the whole SIM side, mm. um, and actually exploiting, using the threat intelligence is still not as high as maybe it should be. You know, you can see there's big blue bars there of low on the threat intelligence. It's, it's, in it's the low other on the threat intelligence, isn't incredible. it? Yeah, I, I mean, to me, yeah, everyone will say security is commoditized, right? Antivirus is a commodity. They're all Perfect. the same. We, we've heard, we've heard yeah. that a lot, and and in many cases you could say, well, okay, I kind of agree with that, but the reality is, is you're not necessarily paying for, you know, the CD or whatever it is. You're actually paying for the threat intelligence that goes inside it. Mm -hmm. um, so so to me, I find threat to me threat intelligence is the core. It's it's what basically tells the security products to block, to allow, and unless you have strong threat intelligence, then. The reality is the products you have aren't necessarily going to work as well. Hmm. So it's, it's strange that it's the smallest bar there because you're saying this is the thing that makes the difference. That's the secret sauce. And it's the thing that hasn't really been explained very well to people. You know, why is this something that we should pay attention to? It's something that's really gone under the radar uh -huh. because it's been so central to the stuff that the security companies have been doing, but not really talked about openly as being a value item. It's been more like, it's something we do and you don't need to worry about it. I would say not commoditized but, yet. Threat intelligence varies yeah. according to who you're dealing with. Yeah, and yeah. now depending on the type of organization that you're in, you might want to be aware that there's a new threat that's just appeared on the landscape in a particular area targeting your industry, because mm -hmm. if that's your industry, then maybe 
you need to do some steps immediately to remediate that. So getting hold of that threat intelligence and exploiting it um, automatically preferably but certainly in a formal process is something that's going to become more important and it's slowly rising. When we asked this question a few years ago the numbers were even lower, they were spectacularly low and I was quite surprised that anybody actually recognised the value of um, the intelligence data but that's growing but again, this is maybe an audience that wanted to take part in the survey in the first place. So maybe these blue bars are actually slightly larger than in the community as a whole, the IT community as a whole. Yeah. Because people wanted to answer a security survey in the first place. So, so we've got a confident like group, there. others engaged here, and yeah. we've got others disengaged, yeah. who we, sadly probably well, aren't probably even watching even today. Yeah. Well, but they might be watching. Well, we hope you are. They, they haven't had time to do We've got good information for you later on, yeah. So let's, uh, let's look at this. So is your bar chart. Yeah. Where does response fall for security. This is a scary uh, this one. This is isn't it? this is the pie chart, you know. Yeah. So, so who's right, re yeah. who's responsible for you know security inside your organisation? And the register audience, the people watching us now, that they know that usually they get the blame. Yeah. And you know, we can see here from the the, the survey that you know, thirty five percent, a third say it, it's really the IT mm -hmm. responsibility. And you know, legally, it's not the IT. No. responsibility. It's the board of directors. It's the governors of the, the organisation. But the scary stuff is at the bottom here. So, okay, we've got some dedicated security guys. Sure, fine, they're responsible, great. But look at these two yellow bars here. Individual, individual users. Individual users. 5% of respondents said that it's down to individuals to protect things. Even more scary, in my opinion, 9% said it's down to the managers of these individuals to sort things out. So you've got 15% there. So what's that? One in six, one in seven, hmm. saying that it's down to people that really don't know that much about security to be responsible for security. Well, you've got even um, more than that that are not well defined. Well, that's interesting that people actually recognise that it's not well defined because yeah. I, I think that's actually a positive sign. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that needs to be defined but isn't. I'm not sure who the other 2% are, though. The, the other. <laughs> but that was something we were trying to puzzle out, but we, we don't have an answer for that. If anyone out there knows, please tell us. You see this sort of thing, Raj. It must make you want to go and be a hacker. I think the most frightening thing is, you know, we've seen, you know, the Cabinet Office come forward with a data handling review, implement these roles as senior information risk owners, i.e. it's the business. We have ISO 27000 where the primary, the first control there is that it should be the business or the CEO to at least enforce this. I, I think for the register audience, if you're going for a job interview in a security function of some description, ask the question, who is responsible and accountable for security? And if they turn around and say it's you, you might want to think about taking that job because the reality is if, if there's a breach, you'll be held accountable. You'll be held responsible and you'll be back in the same situation in two years. The, the interesting point here is that you know IT gets the blame and gets given the responsibility, but it very, very, very rarely gets given the accountability to do something about it. So yeah, they yeah, don't yeah. Give, get given the tools or the influence within the business to change things. You get the blame, but not the responsibility to make change happen and make it stick. People watching this saying, yeah, that, that's exactly how I live. Um, Mandish, if you, you could send your question through again, please, because I don't quite, I don't get it. I want to ask it to the guys. So um, that's, uh, yeah, so this is not an encouraging, an in encouraging slide, is it? But at least we've got the 17% the where it's not well defined. There'll be people who'll be wanting to do something about it. You've got to hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. you've got the 18% where it's a combination of above and we know what it's like anything with committees. It can either be difficult to get things decided in the first place or everybody else thinks somebody else is doing about it. It's a Douglas Adams, somebody else's problem. But ultimately it is the, it is the board's responsibility this, isn't it? Legally it, it, it's the executives, the governors of the company. But you know the interesting thing is we are beginning to see a, a, a shift. So, you know, we've seen a number of very large public breaches just recently. And in those examples, the CEOs and the CIOs were being held responsible such that they were losing their jobs. So there is beginning to be a slight shift in change here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott says maybe the other 2% are the, is the government. They reckon the government should be taking care of security for us. I'll let you know, if, if, you know, even if it is their responsibility, I, 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 don't think that we, <laughs> I don't think we can really go there with them, yeah. So, uh, maybe Scott works for the government. Yeah. So, yes. Now, let's have a look. So, we were saying that it, the execs, it's their job, but um, it's their level job, of awareness. Yes. How many executives really understand security mm -hmm. and the threats to the business and how important you know, securing IT and their business is? Well, you can see here that the number giving it high, 
It's less than half. Um, and that's in the confident group where people are better informed. You look at others and it's way down under 20%. So clearly getting line of business, you know, senior line of business engagement into security is something that's badly missing. And without it, it's going to be really difficult to move forwards. Lovely. So we've got what we've got is responsibility is falling all over the place. Awareness at the very top. Very low. Very low. But can I just add, you know, I think awareness is one thing. Understanding is something completely different. Yep. And, yeah. and, you know, we had a long discussion about this earlier. But if I steal your car, mm -hmm. you can't get to work in the morning. If I steal your data, you can still access it. The reality is, is that the impact of, let's say, data theft or intellectual property theft isn't really felt for maybe years. And so how do I actually quantify an intangible asset like value, uh, sorry, like data? How do I understand, actually, this is a, 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 an impact to the business of what percent? What's the lost opportunity cost? So understanding the value of data is key and paramount so then you can allocate resources accordingly to protect that. Yeah. And, and it gets back to that whole understanding of what's going on because you know the data might have been taken away and copied elsewhere. Do you even know that's happened? So how can you put these things together to understand that, yes, yeah, something has gone wrong? It's the hardest job, right? Absolutely. Know your data. OK, here's, here's, yeah, okay so here's a challenge from, from um, Dionysus. I think that's how you pronounce it, I, I, I hope. Uh, I hope I got that right. Uh, a committee should be responsible. This is the thing you're saying. A committee should not be, should be responsible for IT security management, information security management, and IT risk management. Not one person. You don't put it in one person's hands. It's got to be a committee. As long as the committee is engaged and they're not trying to design a horse that looks like a camel. Maybe. I, you know, it, there is no right answer for this because businesses are different. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you need someone at the top to be able to say. We need to make a decision. This is the decision we're going to go with. I will accept risk. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need to, if you need to get an immediate budget to do something, organising a committee and spending two weeks to get diaries aligned may not be the best approach. Mm -hmm. Committees are great when they work, but if you need to work quickly, they're not the best way forwards. Small committee for general things, very yeah. yeah. You need a very Fast focused decision, you, you, focused you decision need, making. You need on. a committee of you know two or three or four people to really work it in an emergency. Before we, do, before we move on, um, Carlo's got a point back on threat intelligence as well. He's saying now that that threat intelligence you know, is so important, shouldn't um, this type of information also, isn't there a responsibility to disclose in a, yeah, in a reasonable time frame to the general public this sort of intelligence? Because, Maybe. Yeah. May and and so, so this is actually a discussion we had within Brussels. Hmm. Ideally, with we want Europol. With, this is with um, the uh, NIS directive yeah. in, in, in the EU. You know, in an ideal world, we would have transparency. But the reality is, is have we defined what an incident is? Where is it going to get reported to? And if we do disclose, then could that have an, uh, a detrimental impact on broader security? So, in other words, you know, if I say, for example, this was hacked and this is how it was hacked, then am I not giving too much information out to the public? So. I would love to have transparency. I would love to know where my data is. I would love to know all of these answers. But in an ideal world, there's no... It's like every answer in our mm. industry. It depends. Oh, I hate that. I hate <laughs> it when you say it depends. But, but the, point, the key point here is actually understanding what information you've got, how valuable it is, how well it needs to be protected. Is it in places where it shouldn't be? Without that core understanding and knowledge, it's really difficult to do anything or understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, now, Uta says, I think the responsibility and accountability should be clarified. Uh, uh, responsibility yeah. and accountability. Clarify what those are, because uh, when something goes wrong, executives can be accountable but not responsible, but IT will be responsible. Uh, responsibility, accountability, what's the difference? I, I'm not always sure that, that IT is responsible, particularly when organisations are allowing people to use their own devices. Uh -huh. How can IT be responsible for something it can't manage? And the, the flip side of that is that, that responsibility is great, but responsibility is only... It's not fair to blame IT if you don't give them any authority to change things. Mm -hmm. So you can always make somebody responsible, but if you don't let them alter the situation, then they're just going to be your kicking dog if something goes wrong. And that's where IT is seen in many of these organisations where, you know, IT's got, knows it's going to get the blame, but 
doesn't have the rights to change anything. Not always. So, I, you know, I would argue that, uh, so if we take the Cabinet Office, they said, you know, you would have a senior information risk owner and information asset owners, in other words, the business. So the business may be accountable, and IT can say, I need a budget because there is a risk in your environment, mm -hmm. and if we don't do X, then there might be an issue. So the business may say, you know what, I'll accept the risk. In other words, they're accountable. But they may say to IT, OK, fine, go ahead and implement the new firewall or the new uh, whatever it is, whatever security product or tools you want. So the business is accountable, but IT will be responsible for implementing the controls to mitigate that risk. Right. As, I mean, as long as it gets the budget to do the mitigation, oh yeah, that's yeah. where it gets really tricky. OK, need to, do we need to move you on? Because what we need to do, uh, what we need to do is we need to do our poll now. Okay. We've got our poll question coming up to get us on to the, you know, the second half because we're at a halfway point and at this point we're going to take a bit of a turn, aren't we? Because we're going to start talking about exactly what we do about this sort of thing. So we've got our, we've got our poll question that's coming up. So this is suggested by you guys, wasn't it? Yep. And so your, your question, that you, if you could answer it in the, next, uh, in the next couple of minutes, how long does it take you to satisfactorily answer the question, are we infected with CryptoLocker or any other malware variant? How long would it take you to answer that to your satisfaction that it's a pretty good answer? Now, is that, um, is that going to be less than two hours, less than a day, less than two weeks, more than two weeks, or I don't know, I don't know how long it would take. So, uh, yeah, could you give us an answer? Be, you know, be, be, you know, be honest, because we're not going to track you back from what your answer was or anything like that. You know? Neither's your boss. Just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> we just keep it between us. You trust us. But if, if you could do that, um, while, you're, while you're answering that, we'll, we'll get on to this because here is an interesting thing from, um, yeah, it's, it's actually a, uh, a follow-up from Dionysus. Dionysus who, uh, who's, I, I'm sorry, I made a terrible mess of your name. I, I, you know, it's just, apologies. Then, uh, he's saying traditional SIM is not difficult. You just analyze the events and run some reports. The difficulty is to do real-time analysis, correlation, and alerting. What are ways to do that? It's, it's kind of like we set this up, isn't it? We need a the... chair for you. Are, you. are you far from the studios? I suspect you could come and take over. Come on, come on, take over from me. <laughs> you know, and are there tools to combine this with vulnerability assessments and things like that? Now, this is, this is very much your point, isn't yeah. it? So, you know, and this is exactly what you're saying with our little infographic here, isn't it, Raj? So, you know, this is actually from personal experience and probably your personal experience as well. You know, I remember once I was driving into work and, you know, at the time there was an announcement about another major virus that's taking over the world. And when I got into the office, you know, the CTO was sitting waiting for me and he said, are we vulnerable or are we infected with this particular malware? And honestly, my tool of choice was the SIM, but ultimately was Microsoft Excel. And I think it took three weeks to answer that question. And it's not just answering the question, yes or no, but OK, if we are infected, what do we do with that? You know, OK, well, that means I have, I mean, when we did the, the crypto locker work, um, we released a Stinger tool. And basically, people would go around plugging this Stinger tool into hundreds of systems and saying, scanning, are we infected? If you've got an enterprise with thousands of systems geographically dispersed, actually, how do I identify if they're infected? And how do I actually mitigate them from that threat? And it's like buying shares. Remember buying shares years ago? Today, most sims are like a newspaper. You know, you'd look at the newspaper and say, well, what happened yesterday? Yeah, yes. But the way we buy shares today is you'll go to a real-time dashboard, you'll see what's really happening, and you'll make an action based upon the information you have. We need to move away from the newspapers, which is where we are, to maybe, you know, that dashboard. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know you're a Star Trek fan, so you can talk <laughs> about the need for da dashboards and... Real time. The, 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 the real time stuff is absolutely the, the key to everything. It's uh -huh. trying to understand what's going on and reacting quickly. But, um, it's, but what we're saying in all of this is, first of all, you have to clarify some of the things that we were talking about at the beginning, yep. or else you're not even in, you're, you've got no potential to be able to yep. move to a real time if, environment. If you, if you don't know what data you have, what systems you're trying to protect, and as we said, you know, the exposure to systems now might include a lot of the infrastructure in your building, or if you're a um, production company that's making things, it might be your, your whole production line. Um, it could be if you're part of the infrastructure that, that Raj is just about to go through as a case study, all of that. So you've got to understand you know, what's important to you, um, how much do we need to protect it, and actually make sure that you've got the right monitoring tools to know what's going on and be able to correlate subtle changes you know, in 
pretty much close to real time. Yeah, so I've just got a question That's from Tom. Sure. I have to say, got a comment in from Tom here saying, uh, nobody here, here even has the faintest idea what CryptoLocker is. So, <laughs> which case, okay. so in which case, I, you know, you're, you're the last one. You're the, yeah, you, you, you be in the unsure, isn't it? But the, um, the yeah, and there are um, the, okay, so let's look at the market. Let's say the follow-up one is this. So he's basically saying, you know, the, He's seen some comments about the CEO getting it, but does the CIO uh, get it as well? And it's, you know, within 2014, the idea that the CIO might not get this is just untenable, isn't it? I would have thought so. I yeah. mean, pr pretty much if the CEO goes, then you can expect that the CIO is going to be yeah, absolutely. close behind him and maybe some of the other board members do. And the, yeah. the CIO is, and I was at a CIO summit last week, there are 50 CIOs from some of the top companies in the world. And, and to be honest, they're being pressured from the business to revolutionize the way that they work. Hmm. They've got to leverage things like big data, they've got to leverage more personalized computing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so us as a security department shouldn't just be there as policemen, we're the technologists that provide trust in these new ways of working. And in lots of organizations there isn't the security department, that's just the IT guys. Yeah. So that's just something else they've got to take on board. Yeah, so the guys, if, if if the guys have got the uh, getting their results in on our um, on our poll, if we got some results in a minute, that would be quite good. Because then we're going to move on to, because we're going to move on soon to a, uh, to looking at exactly what you can, uh, what you could possibly do about this. Are we, and, and as I speak, the results come in. So, um, so under two hours, less than two hours. That's about uh, between seven and eight percent, slightly less than eight percent. Uh, less than a day, about thirty percent. Less than two weeks, about 11%. More than two weeks, that's about 19%. No idea, a third of people. So, you've got this here. The, uh, the results of the, our poll are in. What does it tell you guys, very quickly? We were right. <laughs> well, I, I'm surprised Sorry. that the under two hours was so high. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, other, you know, you know we've got, at the Reg, we do have uh, a pretty well clued up audience. Oh, certainly. But it's still not easy to find out. But it's still not easy. But that's to what find it, it says. It's, it, yeah. the, these are simple questions with really difficult With very, to find very answers. difficult and quite scary answers. Yeah. But that's frightening when you think a third of businesses don't even know the risk to their organisation. Mm. No. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Now, talking about the rest of the organisation, here's a picture that you drew, Raj. <laughs> what is on this? Tell us what this means. So, the story was, my wife and I were in Dubai, and we went up to the Burj Khalifa, the, the tallest building the big, in the tall world. building, yeah. And so we're in the lift, and, and if you've ever been on, in the lift, your ears pop because it's really, really high. And my wife sort of turned around to me and goes, wow, this is really awesome. It's like being in a plane. And I said to her, I wonder if they're IP-enabled lifts. In other words, the, the, the attack surface, the Internet of Things, will mean everything is connected. Mm -hmm. And this is um, actually a smart grid environment based on a NIST document on smart grid privacy. And what we're seeing is, you know, we talked about this earlier. You had a consumer environment, you had an enterprise environment, then you had a critical infrastructure environment, and never the twain shall meet. But the reality is everything is now becoming connected, such that your electric vehicle, you own. Do you, do you have to patch it? Do you have to update it? Do you have to install security updates to it? That's now being plugged into a grid, which is providing energy to the rest of the country, possibly everywhere else, everywhere else as well. So it kind of puts everything that we were talking earlier in a graphical representation, which is they're all connected. And all those little lines, mm -hmm. are, we're seeing the, the, the compartmentalization that we had before, i.e. the air gaps that we had before, mm. just being smashed down. So, so basically, before you're saying these things would be kind of separate. There wouldn't be very many lines. There wouldn't even be IP enabled in many yeah. cases. But you know, nuclear power plants and being you know connected with IoT. I mean, we've seen nuclear plants, you know, being targeted with malware. You know, everything everything is now being connected. It's being enabled, and just to scare people. And by the way, we'll get to some good news stories later on. But under Project Showdown, which was mapping the internet for industrial control system in, industrial control yeah. systems. There were a million devices as of last year that were connected to the internet. So, in other words, these critical infrastructure. A million industrial control systems control are connected, connected to the internet. To the internet. Directly routable via the internet. Good. Well, that, that isn't very encouraging, is it? Yeah, I'm glad you do have some good news later on uh, on this sort of thing. Now, you're going to take us through 
how you can manage something like this, yeah. aren't you, in the, in, in the next few minutes. So let's just go on to the beginning of it. Let's see. Why don't I, I'm going to give you my, can I trust you with my clicker? Go I want it. it back. This is a register a first. Thought, a little a register out, first. A clicker. Yeah. I'm not sure I want to give it up, to be honest. Well, and so. you can use the clicker because it's going to be easier for you. Just to take us through this very quickly, we've got about 20 minutes to go. Okay, so, great. Yeah. So the environment is a substation environment, but actually the reality is we can do this across any industry, any vertical. And the problem statement came to me about two years ago. And I was in, uh, I was in the Middle East and, um, you know, we just uncovered Operation Night Dragon, which was a targeted attack against oil and gas installations. And the customer and I then sat down and we had a conversation and he said, you know, I'd really like to get to an environment whereby I can build what we call a digital oil field. In other words, we're based here and we have these offshore drilling plants. I'd love the ability to be able to remotely manage these environments. You know, we, we call it a truck roll. So in other words, if we detect an incident, we send somebody on site, but they have a helicopter roll. In other words, if we detect an issue, we have to hire a helicopter, send somebody on site, and it costs about 20,000. Hmm. And so what we said was, well, the sim should be, and, and I was, we were talking about this earlier. I said a quarterback, and maybe because I work for a US company, I think the sweeper, you know, in other words, the captain, the, the, the organizer, Maybe the brain is a better approach. The brain. The brain. The for brain, the, yes. So it's the brain for the security management for an environment. And this was the environment that we built. And actually, we're now deploying this in oil and gas and in, um, and in the energy environment. But actually, I think you can do it anywhere. Mm -hmm. So here, you have what we call a primary substation controller. In other words, something which basically controls the substation. And we would love to be able to put security on that, but the business won't let us because... It means we have to bring it down and install stuff and test it and all sorts of stuff. So what we do is we put a secondary substation controller, we switch it off, and we put security on there. Mm -hmm. Now, in this environment, let's just say that we detect an attack. Now, we've put an insider in there, and this insider is running Metasploit, which is, um, which is a fairly easily downloadable tool. Actually, I taught my daughter this at three years old. So, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the important thing here, though, is actually we detect yeah, we the detect. Exploit. And, right. the, and the reason we detect it is because they're using a well known vulnerability, which is 0867, which you may have heard of, is Conflicker. Yeah. So we detect it using our IDS solution, and the IDS solution then sends it back up to the SIM. Now, this is real time. You've detected the attack, and probably what's happened is the admin probably wakes up, grabs a cup of coffee, and says, Right, well, what do I do about this? Mm -hmm. Now, what sh normally would happen is you'd make a phone call, wake somebody else up, and tell them to go on site. In this environment, what we said was, for remote, offshore, or geographically dispersed assets, let us send a control back up to the primary substation controller and quarantine that from the system, from the network. So now we have the threat's been mitigated, but we've got no availability. Mm. So we can send a separate um, command out of band and switch on the secondary substation controller. So in other words, we've restored the availability of this. And is this happening? How long is this taking to happen? Three clicks. Yeah. Now, here's the really interesting thing. Now, look, in this environment, the attacker is still atta attacking the secondary, but we know that actually the, the, the system's protected. So when we have a change window, we can send somebody on site. But Tony and I talked about this, and I, I, I kind of like to scare people a little bit. Can no, I think I... about it? Did I pass? Oh, it's okay. just, just give it back. Catch. I, I like someone who's given up smoking. I just don't know what to do with my hands. That's better. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> but here's the interesting thing, and I think you know maybe we can spend some time here because, in my in my view, in this environment, why wouldn't we just automate the security response? Yes. Right. So in other words, in this environment, it's great. We mitigated the threat, but we've got these. Uh, we've got these variables in there, right? Mm -hmm. Is the admin out drinking? You know, does, does he actually pick up the phone? Um, you know, well, did I, his system log in? Can we not automate that response? I, I think there's a much bigger part here in that there's lots of these control systems that don't have the monitoring on in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's across industries. It's still, there are still elements of IT that don't have um, classical IT, you know, computer servers, storage, that are not aware and being monitored in a way that gives this real-time information. But, but, you know, can I just say, you know, we have the technology in place, right? They we, say we, ha we have the technology available, it's not always in place. Okay, yeah, sorry, you're right. But, you know, they, they say there's no such thing as a silver bullet, but not every threat's a werewolf. In other words, you know, if we wanted to prevent, you know, um, outbound traffic, there are technologies in place to do mm -hmm. that. But I think I'd like to get into a scenario whereby that response we've known about, that response we've managed to 
understand. So why can't we just get the SIM device to be able to identify the threat and take mitigating actions to be able to do that in real time? And so when you wake up in the morning, you'll just get an alert going, well, there was an attack, we prevented the attack, there's still something funny going on in that environment, so maybe at some point we should send somebody on site. Because that is a really uncomfortable step to make. I agree. To say that there will be no manual intervention, that things like this are going to be switched off, switched out, put on, moved, that sort of thing, without knowing about it until you wake up the next morning. So it seems like a good idea if we can get over the fear. But then, you know, when we have a, when we have a user in between that, you know, I mean, if you read the story about Home Depot with, with the yeah. admin and so forth, but you eliminate that human error. Now, I agree, this is frightening, and, you know, but we are beginning to move to a world whereby you know, we see 60,000 new malware samples a day. You know, and, and the reality is, is most teams are so overstretched anyway. So the, the truth is that most IT guys today recognize that they need to use automation more and more and more. It's a question very much Is that of, coming through in the surveys? It's coming yeah. through in the surveys, yeah, but, but it's a question of you know, which are the comfort zones for the automation? Mm. And so far, it's been pretty much the standard routine operations, the boring stuff that we don't like doing anyway. Mm -hmm. um, moving that into security, I think, is the psychological challenge. You know, do we trust yeah. the tools enough to say, OK, we can go with that? And maybe, you know, don't tell me about it in the morning. I, I might still want my phone to go off. You know, at three o'clock in the morning. Your wife might Je not. Yeah, my, <laughs> yeah. my wife or husband. My, sorry. My, my wife definitely doesn't want that to happen. <laughs> but um, do we want that to be? Tell me about it now, but it's been fixed anyway. So I, I might want to take a check, make sure. But how far are we willing to really let's trust that automation? And I think we've got to do more and more of that okay, because things are so complicated that we can't do everything you know manually. Because even if we do it manually and we know the process, there's still that finger typing you know, stuff. But you know the key here, though, and, and, and we talked about this earlier, this is why threat intelligence becomes so important, mm -hmm. because then you can start to eliminate these false positives. In other words, you can start to say, well, actually, that really is a threat rather than, well, you know, we think it might be a threat, so maybe we shouldn't do something. This is yeah. exactly my question here, and it's coming it's come here. Real-time stuff suffers from false positives and too much garbage. So if you stun, start to automate and you've got bad threat intelligence, you're, you're going to get, yeah, you've got threat, you're, you're false positives all over the place and you'll just, you know, and that becomes a threat to your business. But this is why, you know, we're not suggesting for one minute that people should go out and do this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, there are large enterprise businesses that have things like future centers, proof of concepts. You know, this is something where it needs to be tested to such to the nth degree. And maybe what you do is you do it for the static environment. So maybe for the server farm, because you know no one should be installing iTunes on, you know, on those particular servers. Although a good friend of mine is he's called Scada Hacker, goes around to critical infrastructure plants and has found iTunes running on <laughs> these types of devices. But, but the reality is, is that you know, point of sale devices, right? Yeah. Back off malware has been yep. compromising all of these major organizations. They should be static. So maybe what we do is we start nice and small, and then maybe we can start to extend it out. It's, the, it's the classical automation process. You, know, you start where you trust things, and then you expand the amount of automation that you're willing to use and exploit. And the tools are available to be able to do this if you want to get into it. The, the technology is the maturing. Technology, the, the, the technology yeah. today is much, much more robust than it was three years ago simply because you know there's been a lot of experience gathered in the last three years. Uh -huh. But to do this, you need the business to be able to understand the risk, to be able to accept the risk and take accountability for this. It's not up to you to go yeah. out and install it, and then if it goes wrong, start looking for a new job. I mean, CISO stands for Chief Information Security Officer, not career is so over. <laughs> so, you know, if it goes wrong... <laughs> Security humor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if it goes wrong... Yeah. You know, well, this is why you go through testing, but really the ultimate decision to migrate to this isn't something that you do, it's something that you act as in a consultative position to talk to the business about. The, the interesting thing is how can you gather that confidence that the solution will work for you? So how can you do the testing yes. to make you trust that you can automate things? Mm -hmm. That's something that you're going to have to talk to um, with your executives, as we said, you know, yeah. that, that awareness and appreciation. Awareness is growing slowly. Uh, appreciation of both the potential risks that the organization's under and determining you know, what risks are acceptable because different organizations have different risk acceptability levels. But also then 
do we appreciate that and what can we do about it? Also, are there new things that we can maybe take security for to let us change the business and do things that we previously said, no, we're not willing to do that? Mm -hmm. So getting that awareness and appreciation level raised is probably the single most important thing. I'd actually say that that also goes on to the right hand side and getting employees, you know, the staff at large aware. When we've asked people in the past, you know, does technology on its own um, cure everything? The answer is usually actually it's, it's better to train people properly and mm -hmm. not just in the what to do and what not to do, but why should you not do some things? Why should you work in certain ways? Combining those two elements together, the people, it's the people side that's often the most you, difficult to change. You know what, your, your bars at the beginning of this, Tony, said that whatever effort's been put into it has been stunningly unsuccessful. So far, yes, but, but that whole awareness stuff, you know, the, the fact that people have had so much high profile publicity and CEOs have bit the dust because of this mm -hmm. means that the do nothing approach, maybe that time is now over. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've got to start working on doing things differently. But where can you start testing this out? You know, how can you start testing it out? How do you move from where you are now? Yes. And, uh, that's know, so, the key. So that's the thing. So we're saying take a sort of some baby steps first, put it in things that, meh, you know, there isn't a huge amount of risk if it goes, you know, if, if it's not working well. You know, I... I wanted to perhaps put some good news in it, right? So let's, we've, let's have some good news. So, you know... I, I, was, I was hoping you'd have some sooner or later. Well, so he, yeah. here's the thing, you know, I, I, I was in... Um, uh, two weeks ago, I was speaking at a couple of conferences and, you know, they weren't security conferences, they were technologist conferences. Hmm. And I kind of felt like the most unpopular guy in the room. <laughs> in other words, he's been... I know that feeling. It's usually my job, but yeah. yeah. It's like being at home again. But, you know... <laughs> But, you know, I, these people would stand up. And I remember one person said, you know, we put it took 10 years to roll out the first billion sensors, mm -hmm. i.e. IT enabled, IT connected sensors. And then the last billion would have took, took 12 months. And I kept putting my hand up saying, well, how did you secure this? You know, you put it in the car. How did you in? How did you put the privacy controls in? Well, you know, we didn't think about these things. And the reality is, is that the future, i.e., you know, every business, every sector, are going to be migrating to this this IoT landscape where, you know, we're going to be getting more social. We're going to be asking questions of taking people's personal data. I mean, it's getting security and privacy things right, and all of these systems will be built on the foundation of trust. And you know, we as an industry, we as the technology industry, I think will be the rock stars of the future. We will be there to help define the trust within these systems. So our skills and our knowledge is going to be so important and the really awesome thing is it's not like it was 10 15 years ago I mean my daughter said to me what did you do before YouTube dad you know it was like eight years ago nine years ago well we used to go to a library or if we knew someone we'd ask the information so there's such a wealth of information like the regcast like you know media outlets conferences and so forth so we can start to learn from each other so I think the good news is is that you know there are sources of information it's such such an exciting industry. I mean, you know, who'd have thought after Anna Kornikova 13 years ago that we've now seen nuclear power plants taken down by malware, right? It's it's a really dynamic and fast-moving society. So we're in the right place in the right industry. I, I think the interesting point is that, you know, whilst in the future everything may be built with trust at the core, it hasn't been built that way today. So, you know, the, the next period of time... Well, that means you have time, to go right next, back and start from yeah, so, square so one. The, and the we, next period the is really upwards. the interesting one. How do we get through, you know, yes. until things are built with security Maybe. at their heart? So, so I would almost... I, I agree, you know, and, and if I take the oil and gas example, right? The mm -hmm. oil and gas example was they have brownfield implementations, in other words, existing yep. plants and greenfield. Greenfield we can do from the design up. Sure. But for the brownfield, we really can't just take, dismantle everything and start again. So that's where we start to look at, you know, the, the layers of an onion. In other words, right, well, I'll put, you know, firewalls and idea, but, but, you know, you start to put the compensated controls to address the fact that actually we didn't have the opportunity to build from the ground up. And that's the same for IT systems across the board. Yeah. You've, you've mm -hmm. got to do that inventory discovery of what's out there, what data does it hold, how much risk 
do we associate with that information? What are the policies that we should have wrapped around this? And getting back to the IT policy and the risk profile policy is really important. Not many organizations have done that comprehensively across their infrastructure. They've done it maybe for, for a silo here and there within the business, but mm. not for information as a whole. And what about sharing within the industry as well? Because we've got the question here, do we need sort of big data on the, on the security analytics? Uh, the implication is yes, because you need good information about what's going on very close to the time that it starts happening. So yes, you do need to be able to do that, but that implies a certain amount of sharing, even if it's I, controlled sharing. I think it's real-time analytics is more important than big data. There will be yeah. some examples where big data is the issue, you know, particularly for the IoT type stuff, but, but it's really about getting closer to real-time information. Mm -hmm. It right. depends. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get out. You've, you've had one. I like right. that. Oh, yeah. It's usually my answer. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, in an ID, information sharing is critical. And in fact, you know, I, I don't want to sit and talk products, but we've started to do work around, you know, industry collaboration, developing standards around this landscape. But when we start to talk about real-time, sometimes, you know, the ability to be able to sit around a room and maybe talk about things that you may be sharing or threats that you're facing may not be the best timely approach. So information sharing is critical. Threat intelligence is absolutely critical. Get, getting the right policies and procedures in place is also critical. So I, I'm, I'm a great advocate of, you know, talking to your peers because they're, they're in the same position that you are. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if you can network and share together, you're more likely to garner some good practice, even if it's not best practice. Because but it's not real because, time, though. No, 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 no but, but this is in terms of actually changing from yeah. where you are now going forward. So getting experience and practice there and working together is better than working, you know, alone. Yeah. So, OK, we're, we're down into the, the, you know, the last few minutes of, of what, we, what we're here now. There is what we've so what we've got is we have to you know, we, we agree that building real time, some real time system is essential. Can't do it straight away yet, but you can start taking the baby steps to it. You have to build this uh, trust in the systems mm -hmm. from, you know, upwards. What are we saying that people who've been listening to this and been thinking, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I've got to get this. I've got to get this sorted. What are they going to go away today and do? Uh, you start with that one, Raj. So the first thing is know your risk. Yeah. Begin to understand the assets that you, that you have. Begin to understand the environment that you have. And also begin to understand the governance and the accountability for this. Mm. You know, we've seen today that most people don't even know whether, who, owns, who ultimately owns the risk. And the reality is you won't be successful until you get buy-in from the business. You know, yes, it's great to have a vision. Yes, it's great to be able to say, well, this is where we want to go. But if the business doesn't buy into this, you, you're going to be banging your head against a brick wall, really. So, you know, do the basics right, first of all, and then you can start to move forward, I think. Do you have to demonstrate your value to the rest of the business in this, in being able to do things, be effective? Or does it go the other way around? You have to get the business buy-in before you can be effective? There's a number of ways you can use to influence people. Absolutely, you know, making sure that the business... Making sure that the business see you as not just the people that say no, uh -huh. um, demonstrating the value that you have to the business, but also making them realize, you know, the business is evolving and moving towards this, what we call the third platform. Mm -hmm. We're the technologists that can help you achieve that in a way that your users will trust. Yeah. And, and, and how do we change that? that maybe that perception that, that they have about, well, they're just yeah. the guys that say no to us all the I, time. I think mm. that's the interesting point, that we've got to change it from being, you know, that security is the insurance and the, the people that say no, to it helps the business actually do what the business wants to do. And so that whole mobility yeah. side might be the way to sell this and use that as a, a budget release mechanism, if you like, you know, to not only do the, the mobile stuff, but expand that to do the whole real-time protection so the business can move forward. But, but it does mean communicating differently with those business guys so that they do get a better understanding of, you know, this isn't just saying no, it's doing things for business value. Mm -hmm. And are you optimists, guys? Final word on this? Tony, are you an optimist? You're an optimist Yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but do, do you honestly think that what we've got here with real time, that this is something that can be effectively built? I, I think that it's things that the, the technology is getting much better. And if you're a small business that doesn't have security specialists, maybe it's a managed service or something like that that would work for you. It's not just, security isn't just for the big guys, it's for everybody. So, yeah, I think that yeah. things are moving in the right direction, but we've got to find a way of actually communicating back to the business so that they understand it better.
Mm -hmm. that's, Rod, that's the hard part. That's word for you. We've already built it. <laughs> Just go out and use it. Yeah. All right. Guys, uh, thank you very much. That's been really interesting. Thanks for all your questions today on that. We've got, um, we got through nearly all of them actually and i think i think we covered all the information so thank you very much for that thanks for taking part and I hope it's been useful for you let us know and we'll be back again soon with another regcast and if you want to share this don't forget that it'll be available as an on demand if you just watch the on demand you already know that so uh, from raj and tony i've been tim phillips and a register and so from me goodbye